I learned a lot about how destructive animal agriculture is to the to the environment, to the streams, and the water, the the, uh, the land, the air, and so I, I, writing that book sort of brought me into the movement. Until you have more power over your health than what you've been told. This is the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions Podcast, and I'm your host, Maya Acosta. I'm passionate about finding healthy lifestyle solutions to support optimal human health. If you're willing to go with me, together we can discover how simple lifestyle choices can help improve our quality of life and increase longevity in a big way. Let's get started. What if you can help heal our planet by simply changing your eating habits? Today, Glenn Mercer discusses the impact of animal agriculture on our climate and the countless environmental and health benefits of plant-based diets. As always, you can find the full bio and the links to each guest on our website, HealthyLifestyleSolutions.org. And I hope that you find this episode informative. Hi, Maya. It's great to be with you. I'm going on six years of being vegan plant-based. And in this journey, as you probably know, many of us first come to this way of living first for our mainly our health. Then we learn about the animal uh, the animals and how they're impacted. And then as we continue, many of us come from different aspects. But for me, it was the climate, understanding that we have a tremendous role um, that we can play in terms of helping the climate. Um, before we talk about food as climate, I want to show um, our listeners that I actually have a copy of this book that I think you released in 2020 yes. with a Chef AJ called Own Your Health with tons of recipes, and I have them book bookmarked because this is how I learned to eat healthier. Um, in this book, you tell stories about what it was like growing up in your family and how your mother almost raised you on a vegan diet. Um, I'd like our listeners to learn that you actually have been a vegetarian first, very early on, and then you became vegan. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with our listeners a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, the story is that... Uh... There was a lot of heart disease in my family. Almost all the men in my family on both sides uh, died in their 50s of heart, heart attacks. And I, uh, when I was 16 and 17, my two uncles died, my mother's two brothers. And I didn't know my grandparents. They were dead before I was born. And uh, so I realized that when I hit the age of 25, I would be middle-aged. And I didn't want to be middle-aged at 25. So I decided to become a vegetarian. Now, I wish I could go back in time and remember exactly exactly what I read or who I listened to. And, um, I, I remember I was a fan of the comedian Dick Gregory, and he was a vegetarian. So he was one of my influences. Um, but I think the truth is that it was just generally known that meat causes heart disease. This is in the um, mid-1970s. It was known then. That's, uh, you know, uh, almost 50 years ago. And uh, that's because the science that establishes that meat causes heart attacks is 70 years old. We have studies going back 70 years that meat causes heart attacks. So I think people knew it. And it was unusual then for a teenager, I was 17, to become a vegetarian. And people sometimes ask me where I got my protein and so forth. But when I told them why I became a vegetarian, because there was heart disease in my family, to the best of my memory, everybody said, oh, I understand. People understood, even then, that meat causes heart attacks. We've known this forever. So this is established science. And yet still, from time to time, there are books that come out and arguments you hear that dispute what is as true as hot air rises and two and two is four. So I became a vegetarian at 17 uh, to uh, just to protect myself from becoming middle-aged at 25. And when I told my mother that I became a vegetarian, she said, what took you so long? She said, I wanted to raise you as a vegetarian from birth. And that was a very strange thing to hear. And I said, well, wait a minute. You're not a vegetarian. Dad isn't a vegetarian. My sister isn't a vegetarian. Why in the world were you going to raise me as a vegetarian from birth? 
And she said, because Glenn, when I was pregnant with you, you felt like a vegetarian. So uh, I don't know how to explain that, but uh, she had been determined to raise me as a vegetarian, but she told her doctor who talked her out of it and told her that if I was raised as a vegetarian, my bones wouldn't grow and my brain wouldn't develop and who knows what he scared her with. And so he became the first doctor to harm me and he managed to do that before I was born. Um, and that becomes a theme of Own Your Health, which is how we should use medical care. You know, there are times when you need to go to the doctor and there are times when you need to be wary of doctors. Um, and I tell the story in the book of how my parents saved each other's lives. Uh, my mother saved my father's life because uh, when they were in their 60s, uh, my mother told my father that she needed to go to the dermatologist for some varicose veins to be looked at. My father couldn't stand doctors, but he reluctantly took her to the dermatologist. He waited in the waiting room. My mother went in and the dermatologist said, what seems to be the problem, Dorothy? And my mother said, the problem is my husband. He's in the waiting room. So the doctor went into the waiting room, said, Irving, could you step in, please? My father came into the office. My mother blocked the door and said, look at that thing on his cheek. He refuses to go to the doctor. The doctor looked at it and said, we're going to have to do a biopsy. And it was melanoma. And my, my father never would have gone to the doctor for it. My mother insisted. They did a, an operation uh, and it saved his life. He lived another 25 years. Um, and, uh, and then a few years later, my parents moved to Florida. And I think that my father, in his own not very woke way, saved my mother's life because my mother had heart disease, like, like virtually everyone, uh, all of her siblings. And the, uh, the doc, she went to a cardiologist who was the son of her childhood friend. So she had a relation. She knew this boy since he was born. Um, and, uh, or I should say this man since he was, a, since he was born. And um, uh, he told her that she needed an immediate uh, angioplasty for a 90% blockage that she had in her carotid artery. And my father said, don't do it. He's just trying to make money. Don't listen to him. Just talk to Glenn about what you should eat. And the, you can imagine how angered the cardiologist was and says, who, who are you going to listen to, him or me? My father said, if you listen to him, I'll divorce you. Don't do it. And my mother was put in an impossible situation between her, do her doctor, who she trusted, who was the son of her childhood friend, and her husband, who's threatening to divorce her. So, and my mother hated to make decisions, but she had to make this one. So she turned to the doctor and she said, I'm sorry, but I, I can't, I, I don't want to get divorced. We just got new furniture. So, so she refused the, uh, the angioplasty. Um, she talked to me about what to eat. Of course, I told her not to eat meat and not to eat chicken, not to eat fish and not to eat dairy. I can't say she listened to me completely, but she gave up on the red meat and the chicken. She ate a little bit of fish and, and you know, uh, I think a little bit of low fat dairy, but mainly, you know, 90% she listened to me. She died at the age of uh, a couple months shy of 99. So she lived another 30 plus years from that point with no cardiac events. So I think if she had had that angioplasty, for one thing, there's a 1% chance of dying on the table. Uh, but beyond that, you know, sometimes the stents occlude and you have to go in again. It was more important that she change her diet. Um, and uh, that's, that's what uh, that led to is her changing her diet. You told her, stop, stop eating meat and you saved her life as well. Some, you know, in her last years, I moved my parents to California to be near me and I did their food shopping. 
And when my mother got to be 95, 96, 97, she had outlived everybody she knew. She she was a widow and she outlived all her friends. And sometimes she would say to me, Glenn, why am I still here? And I would say, sorry, it's because I do your food shopping, you know. You're so entertaining that way. And that's what I find about you is that light. Um, hardiness that you have, that funny, I guess the comic in you comes out in your writing. Um, you're very entertaining. Um, so, and, and that's why I enjoyed this book. And I decided that I also wanted to try the recipes as well. I'm familiar with The Mad Cowboy. By the time I saw the documentary or I, I learned about The Mad Cowboy, it all kind of just, I, I said, wow, there are people in the industry that can actually make that significant change. And you were part of writing that book as well, right? The Mad Cowboy? Yes, I wrote Mad Cowboy with Howard Lyman. Yeah. And then you've gone on to write several other books. Eventually, in your own journey, well, it was like Mad Cowboy, Howard, who kind of then introduced you and took you to the next step of becoming fully vegan. Is that right? No, not quite. Um, I had become vegan a few years before I met Howard and, and wrote with him Mad Cowboy. But what Howard did do for me was uh, educate me a lot on what animal agriculture does to the environment. Um, and so in researching that book, um, and Howard guided some of my research, I learned a lot about how destructive animal agriculture is to the, to the environment, to the streams and the water, the, the, um, the land, the air. Um, and, uh, and Howard introduced me to some of the leaders of the plant-based movement. And so I, by writing that book sort of brought me into the movement until then I was what I called a shy vegan, meaning Somebody asked me, I would say, yeah, I don't eat that. I'm a vegan. But I never really talked about it, tried to, I certainly didn't try to convince other people to go vegan. Uh, I was just trying not to have a heart, heart attack. Uh, now, I, now I'm the opposite. Now I spend my career trying to convince people to go vegan because it's not just our own health, it's the climate, it's the planet. It's the only way to save the planet. There is no other path to planetary health other than a global transformation to a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. And I think many of us who, like I said, come to the awareness of how we're impacting our climate, when we do so as part of that journey of first adopting a certain diet, the whole food plant-based diet, which is the most ideal for ourselves, for the animals, for the planet. Um, and then we begin to want to share that information. And I think your book is, it makes it easy for us to kind of know how to address certain arguments. Uh, you said, so, so Howard was the one that sort of introduced you to how we impact animal, ag animal agriculture impacts the environment. And then along your path, Dr. Salish Rao was the one who kind of inspired you even more. Um, and then eventually you wrote your book. Can you tell us how all of that got started and how quickly you wrote Food is Climate? Yeah, well, I was about this time last year and around January 2021, I was working on another book and I wanted to put in a chapter about the climate. And as I started writing that chapter, um, I learned of Dr. Silas Rao, who had written a paper um, uh, making the case that animal agriculture is responsible for 87% or more of greenhouse gases. Now, the UN FAO had originally assessed it at 18% which is still a significant contribution to greenhouse gases. Um, they got some flack from the meat industry. So a few years later, they revised that down to 14.5%. Um, the media often will refer to animal agriculture as about 15% of greenhouse gases. But there was a paper in, I think, 2009 by uh, World Watch Institute Robert Goodlin and Jeff Anhang, 
uh, saying that animal agriculture was actually 51% of greenhouse gases, more than half the problem. So I thought, boy, if, if that's right, 51%, that's remarkable. And now here's Silas Rao saying it's 87%. So I got in touch with him and I asked him questions and asked where he got, got his data and I reviewed the data and I agree with him. And in fact, there are so many ways in which it's impossible to measure, but it may be even more than Silas's. Well, Silas says at least 87%. So if it's 99%, then that's at least 87%. Um, but it may be even more than Silas says in his paper, because take, for example, um, uh, industrial fishing. What do they do? They have mile long nets and they have these, they trawl the bottom of the ocean and they kick up sediment from the bottom of the ocean. Now, when they do that, that reduces the carbon capture of the ocean. Does anyone know how much it reduces the carbon capture of the ocean? No, nobody's measuring that. Nobody could tell. But the oceans are the greatest carbon sink in the world. Uh, nobody can measure uh, when we have reduced whale populations, how much that affects the, then the reduced phytoplankton populations. And the phytoplankton helps seed clouds, which cool the climate. So you see, it's all part of an intricate web of life, and it's really impossible to measure exactly. But every effect that animal agriculture has and industrial fishing has is making things worse. One more example that's on the cover of my book. This image you see here, the red, are what they call pasture maintenance fires. Pasture maintenance fires are set by ranchers all over the world. Uh, this, that's a NASA photograph. Um, uh, when every year, whatever the cows don't eat, the ranchers burn. And there's no telling how much carbon dioxide is going into the atmosphere from all these pasture maintenance fires. It also degrades the soil, and so the soil stores less carbon. And it's hard to measure how much less carbon the, the soil is storing all over the world. So every effect that animal agriculture has is negative. And it's just a, a, a question of making estimates of how, how deleterious it is. But it's clearly the leading cause of climate change. And yet it's that one elephant in the room that other people are not addressing. So they may recommend that we use solar panels, you know, clean energy, that we drive less, um, ride bicycles, all this other stuff. But why is it that we're still avoiding the fact that food has that much of an impact on our climate? Well, this is a, a, this kind of a mass insanity when you think about it. We've been trying for 30 years to address this problem of climate change. And for 30 years, it's always the same thing that we hear about, fossil fuels. We have to reduce fossil fuel burning. Um, we have to have cars that are more fuel efficient. Where we have to have electric cars. We have to have heat pumps. We have to have uh, solar panels. Well, all those things are to the good. We want to have uh, renewable energy. I'm all in favor. I drive a car that's mostly electric. Um, I'm all in favor of reducing fossil fuel burning, but realistically. After 30 years, we're burning more fossil fuels than we were 30 years ago. Realistically, are we going to have solar airplanes anytime soon? There, I, of all the 18 wheelers on the road, I don't think there's one that's electric. It's just not going to happen anytime soon that we stop burning all fossil fuels. The cooking, heating our, of homes, uh, transportation, manufacturing, fossil fuels are involved in all those things. And clearly, we're not going to replace that anytime soon. Now, we can reduce it and we should reduce it and we should move to renewables. I'm not holding any brief for the fossil fuel industry. But to be realistic, 
it, we're not, nobody's calling for ending the airline industry and the airline industry burns fuels. So let's be realistic. What can we do? Because the problem is real and we can hit a, clipping, a, a tipping point at which there's no turning back when the permafrost thaws and more and more methane is released into the atmosphere, we could become planet Venus and we won't be supporting life. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a problem that is, you know, as urgent as any problem could be. So let's get serious. How could we seriously address the problem? And the answer is that we have to have strategies that reduce greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Solar panels do not sequester carbon dioxide. All they do is try to replace the burning of, let's say, coal. So that's a good thing, replacing the burning of coal with solar power, but it doesn't draw down anything. We have to draw down. How do you draw down? And the answer is forests. It's an answer as old as time, as old as the earth. We need forests and we need healthy oceans. So how do we get forests and healthy oceans? How could we possibly do that? Is everyone gonna plant a tree in their backyard? Well, it's a good thing if you plant a tree in your backyard, plant five, plant 10, but we need a vast amount of the earth to be reforested and rewilded. Well, where do we get this vast amount of the earth? There's only one way. 40% of the earth is currently being grazed by animals. All we have to do is get those ruminant grazing animals off that land, rewild that land, let the forest come back, stop the industrial fishing, let the fish and the whales and the dolphins come back, have healthy oceans again, let the phytoplankton bloom again, let the sea forests bloom again. If we have healthy oceans, which we can have as long as we stop fishing, and we have healthy land, which we can have as long as we uh, stop the grazing, then the earth will heal itself. And on the remaining portions of the land, we can have our cities and our suburbs and our farms, and we can fly in airplanes and drive our cars. And yes, it'll be better if they're electric. And yes, it'll be better if the electricity is generated with solar and wind. So I'm all in favor of that. But there's no solution other than letting the earth heal itself. And the way the earth heals itself is if we leave as much of it alone as we can. And what we have to leave alone is the grazing land and the oceans. Because there are two different things we're talking about. It's how we're contributing to the green gas emissions in the first place, just in general through lifestyle, what we drive, what we eat. The other thing is, and that's exactly what you talked about, what we can do to kind of reverse or um, sequester that carbon that's already in our atmosphere. These are the things that um, are not necessarily being addressed by the big names the um, in politics um, or politicians that could have influence. They're not, they're not talking about that. So you said the power lies in our hands. We as individuals becoming informed and knowing this knowledge, which is why I think you said that's why you wrote the book so fast and, and, and to the point so that we we get it and then we begin to share that information with one another and that's how the information is going to work we can't expect someone like bill gates to address how food affects climate well yeah i mean he should but he won't and al gore won't and paul hawken won't um they they're stuck in the stories they're telling uh, bill gates in his book says we emit 51 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year. We need to reduce that by 51 billion tons. We need to get to zero. All right, but I can't. I read his whole book. I didn't find the page where he said, I've invented solar airplanes. I didn't find the page where he said, I'm, I'm starting a factory to make 18-wheeler electric trucks. I didn't find the page where he said, 
I'm replacing natural gas in everybody's uh, kitchens with, uh, you know, solar heating devices. He doesn't have, he just has this wish <laughs> to reduce it to zero. You can't live on a wish, but it's the easiest thing to do. What, what you and I do, just eat plants instead of dead animals. And the only side effect is you get healthy. Yes. And I like how in that same book, in your Food is Climate, you offer recipes for the people that say, well, then, you know, how do I get started? What do I eat if I'm not eating meat or consuming dairy? Well, there you have it. You have recipes in that book. Yes, there are, uh, I think, 65 recipes in Food is Climate and I think 135 in Own Your Health. And um uh, there's, so I just didn't want that to be anyone's excuse not to do this. I don't know what to eat. Eat human food. Human food is whole grains, fruits, vegetables, legumes, which are beans, peas, lentils, and mushrooms and nuts and seeds. Uh, so just basically eat plants. Technically mushrooms are, are fungi, but Let's call them plants. Just eat plants and don't eat animal foods. And it's so easy. It's the easiest thing I ever did. And, uh, you know, uh, and then the only side effect is um, you find that your health improves. You reach your optimal weight, your health improves. Uh, you know, I've made so much money in my life for health insurance companies because every year I said, well, I have to have health insurance. So I paid for my health insurance. And then every year I never went to the doctor because I'm eating plants. So I just, you know, just handed my money to the health insurance companies, you know, and they talk about the skyrocketing cost of health care. Well, not from me. You know, I'm eating plants. I never need to go to the doctor. You have also said that the vegan solution leaves about 80% of the earth alone. Yeah. Um, so just by making that choice of not consuming um, animal products, we're leaving a large portion of the earth alone because 70%, I believe you said, is the ocean. And if we just stop eating fish, that in itself, it takes care of a lot of um a lot of ways that we can protect our planet. Yes. Now, you know, there are other um, insults to the ocean. For There's plastics, there are cruise ships. So we need to do other measures to try to protect the oceans. But the, the what's really killing the oceans is the industrial fishing. So it will go a long, long, long way towards saving the oceans if we just stop eating fish. Um, and, and then, yeah, we need to talk to the people who run the cruise ship lines and see if they could be a little more responsible. But it'll go a long way to saving the oceans if we uh, stop industrial fishing. And then the earth, you've got close to 40% of the earth is grazed and another 6% of the land the non-ice land surface of the earth is used to grow feed for animals. We actually grow five times as much food for animals as for us humans. So imagine how much more food we would have if we stopped feeding the animals and stupidly eating the animals and just ate the food directly. So you free up the land that's wasted growing food for animals, you free up the land that's wasted, grazing animals, you end the stupidity of eating animals, and then the earth can heal itself. And the one thing that we as individuals can do to help uh, not only raise awareness, but really just to improve the, the health of the planet is to just start eating more plants I went overnight, I transitioned overnight, and some people may take a little bit longer. But we know that there's a lot of support. Chef AJ's channel um, continuously offers support and resources, and she has so many recipes out there um, for people to learn. Is there anything else that we can do? All right. The, the most important thing everyone could do is to go vegan and stop eating animals. That's the most important thing you could do for the climate. 
Now, there are other things you could do for the climate, like not over consuming goods and uh, uh, not driving a, 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 a fuel inefficient vehicle and, um, you know, recycling and so forth. But the most important thing everybody needs to do is to go vegan. And then I would say beyond that, the word vegan only describes what you're not eating. Vegan means not eating or not using animal products. But, you know, you could be a vegan and have a diet of donuts and beer. That's not healthy. So um, I encourage everyone to be a healthy vegan. And all the recipes in all my books are healthy vegan recipes with no oil, no sugar. Um, and, you know, these are low fat, whole food, healthy vegan recipes. And the reason it's important to be a healthy vegan is even if your only concern is the animals, even if you're not concerned with your own health for some reason. Um, if you're, you just became a vegan for the animals because, you, you know, you're, you, you're an animal rights person, um, then don't you want other people to be vegan for the animals? And don't you think you'll influence more people to be vegan if you're healthy? You know, so um, we need uh, fit, healthy, vegan people who can make a good, strong case to other people. Hey, you, you have heart disease, you have diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you have uh, infl inflammatory conditions, autoimmune diseases. Why don't you try following my diet? Look at me, I'm healthy. And, and, and so it's, I think we're all morally obligated, not just to be vegan, but to try our best to be healthy vegan. When you were comparing um, animal-based foods to nicotine, nicotine itself, like the body does have an addictive type of response when once one person has been smoking for so long, but when it comes to food itself, it's not that we're actually addicted to meat. It's not like the body will go through a withdrawal um, experience if they don't consume red meat, right? As far as I know, there's nothing addictive in meat. It's, it's just uh, culturally accepted, culturally expected. Um, and, um, and people obviously gain a taste for it. Um, but, um, you know, it's not like when I was 17 and I cut it out overnight, I felt any withdrawal pains. I didn't, I think sugar, I think there's a better case that sugar is physically addictive. Um, and, um, uh, might be harder for some people to cut out sugar. Um, but you know, meat is just a cultural habit and we have to accept, we have to face the fact that our cultures aren't, um, you know, uh, perfect. You know, um, Anthony Bourdain used to have a show where he would go around the world. What was it called? Uh, I forgot the name, but yeah. I, before I was vegan, I enjoyed watching it. Yeah. <laughs> he would go around the world and meet with people and partake in their food. And he was celebrating their food cultures. And, and Bourdain was a fascinating character. He was a wonderful writer. He was a great writer. He was a bright guy. Um, and he, uh, and he, often his television shows uh, had very intelligent, sometimes even charming interviews. You know, so all that was to the good. But then he, he literally celebrated the killing of animals. And, and so why would a man celebrate the killing of animals? He, he literally on air would wring the neck of a chicken or, or slice the throat of a pig. And it was like a snuff show for meat eaters, you know? He, he would literally do this on, the, on, the, on screen. And it was because he believed that it was all part of the circle of life. Death was part of the circle of life. Well... Yeah, it is if you're a carnivore, <laughs> but human beings are herbivores. It's not, but look, I'm not slicing the throats of any pigs. I'm fine. I'm not wringing the necks of any chickens. I'm fine. I never go to the doctor. So you don't need to do this. It's not part of the circle of life. It's part of the insanity of some cultures, of most cultures. 
And so while he, he his attitude was all cultures must be celebrated, well, there's much to celebrate in every culture, whether it's the Mexican culture or the Jewish culture or the Irish culture or the French culture. There's much to celebrate, but that doesn't mean that every aspect of it is holy. You know, my people ate the worst possible food imaginable, and that's why there was heart disease in my family. Uh, and there's, take a look at it. Look at it. Let's call this the American culture, and we're a blend of cultures from all over the world, but it's now part of the American culture that we have slaughterhouses all over the country, which are so horrific that they try not to show pictures of them. It's now part of our culture that we have lagoons of pig waste and cow waste and, and uh, you know, uh, chicken waste. It's part of our culture that our streams are defiled by the, by the pig waste and by the nitrogen fertilizer that's used to grow the crops for the animals. All these things are now part of our culture and it's insanity. There are people who, who you know, have houses in North Carolina and Iowa and the, the, they can't even sell their houses because they go outside and there's this terrible odor from the, the pig waste lagoons. You know, is, this a, is, that, is that something to celebrate? It's part of our culture. When Anthony Bourdain was eating that chicken and saying how delicious is what it was, well, this is the side effect of it. Now, Bourdain, unfortunately, tragically killed himself. And we don't really know why he killed himself. But clearly, he was suffering from depression. And depression is often caused by inflammation. When you get inflammation in the body, it affects all your organs, including your brain. And it could lead to depression. Now, the man was eating every part of every animal he ever encountered. So he may well have brought on tremendous inflammation in his body that may have affected his brain, and he killed himself. I don't know for sure that that's why he killed himself, but it's certainly a possibility. Depression goes hand in hand with meat eating. I'm so glad that you talk about this because you, you say it's really a battle uh, of culture uh, itself, not so much. A, we can know the science, but we want we somehow deeply still identify with the foods in our culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why many of us love to travel and meet other people uh, that are different from us. And at the same time, with these healthy recipes, we can still experience the Mexican culture yeah. and other cultures throughout the world. Just a little healthier without added oil, yeah. added sugar, added salt um, that are not animal derived, but they're plant based. Yeah. Bourdain hated vegetarians and vegans, and he, he, most, he most particularly hated us because he thought it was so rude if you're if you're a guest in somebody's home and they're serving, you know, pork bellies or something to say, no, I don't eat that. He just thought that was terribly rude. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't eat pork. <laughs> so if you know, I'll tell somebody in advance if they're inviting me to dinner, I am a vegan. I, I, I you have to be aware I don't eat animal foods. It's nothing rude about telling people that I, I have a culture too. In my culture, I don't kill animals unnecessarily. That's just my culture. Respect my culture. And, you know, I'm all for celebrating folk dancing and music and uh, costumes and whatever else cultures have. But if part of the culture is killing animals unnecessarily and getting sick, I mean, in Mexico, the problem with meat eating now is as bad as in the United States in terms of health, the obesity and other things. They took it from us, and it's a big, big problem. And I, you know something? It's part of maybe the Mexican cuisine and Mexican culture today. It's not the traditional Mexican cuisine, which was corn and rice and, or corn and potatoes, I think, in different parts of Mexico. 
Yeah. I grew up in, well, early, I was born in Mexico City, and I remember, I lived there a short time before we came to the States, but I remember the market setting up, and I don't even think back then my my family actually kept like a refrigerator or freezer, mm -hmm. because they wouldn't store food for a long time. They would shop two or three times a week there at the market, and so I still remember the fragrance of like the cilantro and the tomatoes, and just yeah. the vegetables, really produce is what yeah. we ate. I don't remember eating large portions of meat yeah. and it's changed so much in the last few years um, that we become so addicted to these fast foods. Um, and yet, and at the same time, there's a shift happening. It might be on a smaller scale, but a shift of awareness that people are understanding. Um, like you said, we kind of already know that food, that meat is not healthy for us, but more and more people are understanding about dairy, the impact of dairy. Um, and why they should eat more kale and things like that. So um, is there anything else as we're beginning to wrap up, anything else that you would like our listeners to know about you or your book? Well, I could offer a, uh, a, uh, a bonus recipes. Uh, if uh, readers, uh, if your listeners purchase a copy of Own Your Health, just send an email to Own Your Health Book. Own your health book at gmail.com and I'll send you some bonuses, including bonus recipes and a, uh, a Chef AJ uh, carrot cake recipe and a video of her making that recipe. And with Food is Climate, just send proof of purchase of Food is Climate to uh, foodisclimate at gmail.com. And I'll send you a separate set of bonus recipes. Just put bonus in the subject line. So own your health book at gmail.com. Food is climate at gmail.com. And put bonus in the subject line. And um, uh, I will send you bonuses, free bonuses. Okay. Wonderful. I'll make sure to include that information in the show notes. And I also want to emphasize that you've said that it's best when it comes to your food is climate book, it's best to purchase it through Amazon. Because right now it's doing well in the category of climatology. Is that right? With, for, with food is climate, it's available really, primarily through uh, Amazon. Own Your Health should be available at all bookstores. Well, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for this wonderful work that you're doing to raise awareness. I'm excited to purchase additional copies for my loved ones as well, because I'm eager to share this information. And also, sometimes I meet environmentalists, environmentalists locally that are not aware of this or that, again, are avoiding the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that this will be kind of a gentle way to introduce them to this topic. Thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you, Maya. I enjoyed it. You've been listening to the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions podcast with your host, Maya Acosta. If you've enjoyed this podcast, do us a favor and share with one friend who can benefit from this episode. Feel free to leave us an honest review on Apple Podcasts. That helps us to spread our message. You can also head on over to podinbox.com forward slash HLS to leave me a voicemail. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always... Thank you for listening.